This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Tech, show number 119, recorded on May 30th, 2013. Here on Home Tech, we cover all your favorite tech gadgets that find their way into your home, news, reviews, and product updates, and conversation all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Collison, broadcasting live from the AverageGuy.tv studios. Here in a very stormy uh, Bellevue, Bellevue, Nebraska, we actually have some thunderstorms coming through tonight. Hoping the power stays on. So if all of a sudden I go dark, I have UPS that will get us through a short power outage. But if it goes dark, hopefully the lights will come back on. And, of course, we post the show each week with world-class show notes out at TheAverageGuy.tv. If you have questions or comments, even some contributions, you can contact the show via email. Just send me an email, podcast at TheAverageGuy.tv. Track me down on Twitter at Jay Collison or follow the show schedule on Twitter at TheAverageGuyTV. You can also join us for live chat. I mentioned it in the pre-show um, over at TheAverageGuy.tv slash live, right next to the live stream window to the right is a uh, live, is live stream chat, and uh, you just all you have to do is create a handle, jump in, and join in the chat, and then we try and follow that uh, chat as we go throughout the show. We've also improved the video. Hopefully, it's looking a little bit better, but if you like better quality video, actually, the YouTube player that's right below the live stream, you can just uh, hit play. Make sure you stop the live stream so you don't have two streams. Don't cross the streams, but uh, start YouTube, and you can still join us for chat, and that YouTube is playing live. Right now, all right. We got a busy week. We uh, we finished up. We wrapped up our uh, our laptop conversation um, two weeks ago. Had a great discussion in Home Tech 118 with John Zadler last week. Had some home server stuff. If you haven't gone back and done that, you want to check out uh, theaverageguy.tv slash ht118. That is last week's show. And John will join us again in three weeks. Actually, coming up here, we'll have three shows. I think no. I'm sorry. We'll have, yeah, we'll have three shows on virtualization. Uh, this one and next week, and then on the 9th, I think that's the weekend in between, we'll be live with the BYOB guys at the BYOB podcast. Uh, we'll be broadcasting it, simulcasting it right here at TheAverageGuy.tv. It'll be a Sunday afternoon, and we'll have those guys covering virtualization as well. So three shows on virtualization, 119, yeah, 119, 120, and 121. If you're listening to the recorded version, all those will be around virtualization in the home, and there's some good stuff coming up. I put the word out a couple weeks ago and said, hey, who wants to talk about virtualization? And the guy who jumped in first was Paul Brer. And Paul, welcome to the show. Glad you could come out and be a part of it tonight. Thank you, Jim. It's great to be here. This is fun. It's yeah. always fun. Yeah, it's Hope good to have you. Something. You bet. Good, you. good to have you here. Next to him uh, in in the, uh, the Hangout, a, a newbie to podcasting, at least here, on Home Tech, and uh, we're glad to have you, Kyle Wilcox. Kyle, how are you? Hi, I'm doing good. Good. Hey, Kyle, how long uh, you've you've been out on the fringe of the community, kind of popping in, putting things in uh, in the you know in the uh, the forums and such? But how long have you been hanging around the the average guy home server show community? How long have you been listening? Yeah, um, actually, pretty much exactly one year. Um, I uh, I was I actually took a trip to Austria and I was like I'm gonna need something to listen to so I just started searching for podcasts and I put in server and I found I was like who are these home server guys and then it was all history after that so all right yeah well I'm glad that you glad you found us glad that uh, you got a chance to jump in with us today tell us real quick since you're new to the podcast just uh, kind of where you're from what you do those kinds of things um. Uh, I'm in, actually, I'm in Indianapolis now, um, so I'm like probably 20 minutes away from Dave. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. All right, very so nice. So I'm very close for the meetup. That's super convenient. Yeah. So I got that, and I, um, right now, I, I mean, I graduated last year from college, and yep. right now I'm working at Best Buy. And, awesome. And uh, doing just cell phones every day, so cool. just working the whole cell phone department. And um, then I've also been doing like some substitute teaching on the side and stuff like that, and nice. just keep keeping up on technology. So, good deal. Well, you're in at Best Buy, so it's good to have you. Uh, good to have you. Always have somebody on the inside of things, and so appreciate you coming out to podcast with us tonight. And then, last but not least, and actually last and least, will be Andrew Morris. He'll join us here in a few minutes. But all the way to the left, Christian Johnson. Christian, how are you? 
I'm doing well. Um, I'm going to work hard this show to uh, defeat the false accusations that I got earlier that I <laughs> vacantly stare the entire podcast and don't participate in the recent months. So apparently, apparently, I need to start pushing people out of their spotlight time and right, getting aggressive questions. with content. So like it's it. on. It's yeah. on. That's um, right. On like Donkey Kong. Christian, you, uh, you've done a new thing with Twitter. I mean, uh, what's going on with your, tw your Twitter account and, and why the new sudden surge in Twitter for you? Right. So um, uh, no one knows on the show, but Jim has been my secret mentor in all things social about Twitter because I've been pretty much a Twitter illiterate for the past oh, year at least. And uh, finally wanted to start getting into it because I am, I pop in and out of so many different communities and stuff and I am kind of have my hands in so many different projects that I kind of need a place to unify and features some of the stuff I'm doing so uh, it's really a effort to try and streamline and uh, put together um, my following and uh, hopefully put out some eventually it's it's a work in progress but uh, get uh, my content base together so that eventually I can start uh, producing and, and linking to some of my written content which is still in the works um, and eventually just try because you know originally I had a uh, another Twitter feed that I used for some of my other sites and it just wasn't working out having the whole website feed versus personal feed and uh, I'm really trying to go for getting my personal following set up so uh, please I'd be more than happy to hear from you at the WizBM um, and of course I will be doing my best especially over the summer uh, I leave Saturday morning uh, to head back to uh, good old Hampton Roads and uh, work back at with uh, on center with NASA this summer. Um, so it'll be great to be back out of telework and back on the job. And uh, along with that comes a lot of uh, technical ideas, work, um, and meeting some other people. So I'll be posting some neat stuff, and uh, hopefully it'll be worth your while to follow. So. Yeah, absolutely. Go go out and get them followed. Just as a as some uh, as some show notes of some things coming forward there, Christian and I. I think it's um, June thirteenth. You know, June thirteenth. We're going to get together with the guys from from Vigo, and uh, have a discussion with them about the robot. So uh, Christian will have a chance to talk about that. We'll so we'll do the three VM shows, and then we'll have Vigo on. So we got four great weeks coming up, and right behind that, John Zadler will be back with some more home server show. Uh, or home server talk, home server show talk too. And uh, so we got five good weeks coming up. You don't want to miss uh, home tech. Let's dig right in. Let's talk about virtualization. We uh, had some, I've been throwing this out over at the Facebook page. If you go to facebook.com slash groups slash the average guy, by the way, the conversation's getting dynamite and I appreciate everybody who's come out to be in that group. Lots of activity and lots of great conversation going on out there. And I kind of threw it out and said, Hey, what do you guys want to talk about on home tech? Because, this topic format seems to be working really well. I'm getting a lot of good, positive feedback from you guys, both during the show and after the show on it. And so uh, one of the topics that came up, and I wish I could give credit to who that was. Hey, Kyle, was that you that uh, came up with the with the virtualization idea? Yeah, I think I threw that one in there. And so, yeah. yeah. No, yeah, perfect. So, and I said, hey, that would be great because many of us uh, have been toying with the idea of virtualization at home. The uh, uh, the you know it's getting easier and easier and easier to use virtualization and not everybody is is as familiar with it and so I thought uh, I'd throw that out and the guys come in and talk about it so we're going to do that this evening Paul let's start with you and uh, and I know if anybody's listened over the last three series you, you got us started with the home networking uh, I think you got us started with the laptop stuff. Uh, why would I not start with you from the VM stuff? Give us a little background on what you're using. Don't go too far back, but a little background on what you're doing, what you're using, those kinds of things, and kind of how you're approaching virtualization there in your environment at home. Uh, I think you're muted, Paul. Sorry. Well, I didn't want to get yelled at about the clacky keyboard. <laughs> Already uh, coming out with uh, a swing. <laughs> Got to hit the take the heat off a of huge Christian. Yeah, that's uh, right. yeah, yeah. No, no. Those of you that know me, uh, know I've talked about virtualization for a while, and publicly actually recently at a couple of VMware and uh, and a security user group. Uh, why would people have a security user group or various 
IT professionals like myself at these user groups listen to someone talking about virtualization at home, right? Uh, well, because a lot of them are trying to get themselves certified, keep their skills up to date, or even use it for practical reasons. So that's what uh, I really got into big, in a big way about four years ago doing virtualization on my laptop, and then finding, finally building a custom server about two years ago and starting my website to blog about it uh, to make sure I would be highly motivated to succeed with that project. Spending money for a Core i7 that lives in my basement gets to run 24-7 at a, a nice miserly wattage and an affordable price point and lets me uh, juggle about 12 operating systems that I just leave running day and night efficiently and effectively. So, Paul, let's talk, about, let's, yeah. let's talk about that power real quick. That's kind of near and dear to my heart. I just got this, this new, new to me, uh, Dell Precision 690 uh, kind of workstation that I've turned into a server. I put 32 gigs of RAM in and I got a couple hard drives spinning and it's running at like 350 watts. Have you thrown your virtualization server on the kilowatt meter and what's it running at? I have. Before I put hard drives in there, I was uh, at like 8 watts and now with, um, let's see. 8? Did you say 8 watts? But no, no, 80. It's a Core 80. i7. Oh, okay. So right. yeah, you're not going to get it down into sleepy mode like a Core i7 desktop with one CPU doing almost nothing with one operating system, it's going to run a little a little hotter, um, more like full bore. Not with fan roaring, but 80 watts, 70 watts, it's pretty reasonable for a Z68 motherboard from two years ago, 32 gig of RAM, like you said, four memory sticks, and finally, um, no hard drives. Adding the hard drives, let's see, nine total, uh, eight of them external, uh, and a few internal. Uh, all of that's still only 120 watts. Okay. If I bang away at the CPU on two or three VMs at once, the most I can get out of it is 140 watts, but most of the time when it's idle, it's under 100 watts. Just not a big deal. Um, single single CPU though. I'm running a dual yeah. core Xeon. This is dual core Xeon. Yep. Um, I think was running before I upgraded the memory in it, running at about 150 watts. Uh, at four four gig of memory in it, upgraded to 32. Does that seem like that makes sense? That I would go from 150 watts to 300 by adding. 32 gig of RAM is RAM yeah. typically uh, that 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 power intensive on higher end workstations or server class machines. You know, Xeon generally you get more than the four DIMM slots that you typically get in the consumer commodity affordable motherboard. So how many DIMM slots, memory slots did you have? Jim? Well, it's got eight across the board, but I've got memory risers on it, so that all 32 sit in those memory risers coming up. So yeah, it, it all adds up. Yep. It goes it goes into four slots. You know, those memory risers have two slots each for the channels and then those go in. So I guess I just didn't expect, uh, you, you know, going to go, you know, kind of double the wattage going from four gig to 62, um, yeah, four gig to 32 gig of RAM yeah. on there. So I can take up a little juice at 350, you know, about 350 watts with just a couple drives in it. Yeah. Um, back in April of 2011, I was taking the watt meter to some hand me down servers from my day job. And, uh, Wow, six or eight hundred watt, you know, beasts with dual power supply, just not appropriate at home. That's a, over a thousand dollars of electricity per year if I leave it running, and uh, I can't expense that. That's not good. It's just too much heat, too much noise, and too much money. Um, you know, think of it. If I was going to run it for two years, twenty-four-seven, like I've now successfully done, um, you know, I would spend two grand just in electricity to leave that thing humming. So when I went to build, I was thinking, okay, I'm going to go with Core i7 commodity motherboard. As long as it runs VMware, uh, ESXi hypervisor well, and I had to tinker with that quite a bit, and I tried four different brands of motherboards and paid some return costs and finally settled on uh, a solution that worked for me with only four DIMM slots, again with an eye on the watt meter, thinking if I can do this with $200 or 32 gig of RAM, uh, that's what I want. Uh, I want my money spent on the, the RAM, not you know, other frills that you don't really care about for a virtualization server. Now, why so many boards? I mean, is ESXi just that picky about the hardware that it uses? Uh, I was trying to do some unique things called passing through or VM direct path. It's an Intel feature where if you buy a 2600, not the 2600K, but the 2600, the non-overclockable, non-gaming, $300 Core i7 from two years ago, if you went with that CPU, you could do something special on VMware. You could say, take this USB 3.0 card, or take this a network adapter, take some PCI device you stick on the machine and assign it or pin it to just one particular virtual machine. That's the part that made it picky. 
Looking back, did it end up mattering that much? No, because I found other workarounds for what I was trying to do with my external enclosures. I ended up using SATA instead of USB 3.0 and just moved on. So in hindsight, I could use any of those brands, Gigabyte, MSI, ASRock, ASUS. They all would have done in the end. But the brand I settled on, and ASRock Z68 uh, Fatality motherboard, really a gamer motherboard, uh, the appeal for me was it had many SATA ports for many drives. Um, I haven't added RAID controller later on, but I wanted to have a lot of ability to have SATA 3 full speed solid state drives. And man, I used those a lot. That's what I needed. You know, a motherboard that cost upward of 200 that had lots of places for SATA 3 connections. So my shopping was focused on staying under 300 for the CPU, staying a little over 200 for the motherboard, saving some budget for that RAM, which is key for any virtualization project. If you're going to have 12 VMs running all the time, you need RAM. That's what you run out of first, typically. Yeah, and and there was a question in chat. Uh, Ooh, any, read those, yeah, yeah. Any uh, any consideration? You talked about a Core i7. Any consideration for any of the Xeon, or were you you pretty much set on staying core with the Core series? Yeah, no. It's really I wanted to buy two motherboards and hang on to them for three years. So I bought two of the same motherboard: one for a gaming machine, one for a uh, this other rig, and then I can move memory DIMMs and CPUs back and forth. This things croak over time, in, inevitably. So that was my logic. If I went with Xeon, yes, you could get a super micro or tie-in or something a little higher end and more costly. But you're also looking at ECC memory and more DIMM slots, more watts, more costs, more costs. So I kept thinking about, I want to blog about this for the next two years and leave it running 24-7. And to do that without feeling guilty, I want to stay low on the watts. And I don't think I would have achieved that with a Xeon with eight memory slots. And, 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 and <laughs> as I'm enterprise. finding out, as I'm finding out right now, I, I, yeah. I you know, I'd, I'd fired that up at the four gig, and it was running like one, you know, one fifty, and I'm like, oh, this isn't too bad. And then I put thirty two gig in there and just shot way up. And uh, and yeah. so yeah, that's it's good memory footprint. They're giving me a hard time about my carbon footprint now in chat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a different way to look at it. it depends on what you're replacing, Jim. Let, let's say you had three machines before it you might have still halved your watt burn, right, if you're actually able to turn off two or three machines after you build this new one. So either way, you're heading in the right direction. Yeah. I guess uh, if I was replacing a lot of older machines, too, if, if you're new to the virtualization, you know, concept, right, you are just bringing in, you know, you're taking physical PCs and putting them in an environment where they're running virtually. So if you had a, a P4, you know, if you're trying to run Windows 7 off of an old P4, that thing may be pulling some serious wattage on there that you can condense down onto the server. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, as I rambled on at the beginning of the story, right, I was talking about dual power supplies, enterprise, server class stuff. All of that absolutely makes sense when you're trying to do, you know, 24-7 uptime. But in a home environment where it's not that big a deal to shut down, you don't need a change control window to talk to your family. You can just, you know, reboot generally. Um, you know, the fact that you can have two power supplies plugged in, do you really need that at home? No, right. uh, generally. Right. How, however, you know, I did have to spend money out of pocket for commodity stuff, right? This is a, a personal project that I went right. you know, kind of going home on. Um, but it was a lot of fun. There was a whole lot of and articles came out of it. Um, I've been blogging about it on Tinkertry.com for about two years. And this Saturday is my two-year anniversary, and I've written 300 articles. About a Jeez. quarter of them are virtualization-based. So absolutely a blast. I have no regrets about what I bought. It was the best two grand I ever spent. Now, Paul, they're asking. They're asking in chat. Uh, so you say two thousand was what you, was the, what your total investment in is? is you think? Roughly, it went a little higher in year two as I started beefing up the RAID controller. That's kind of a separate aside, but that was another um, solid state caching of a RAID five that cost some money. So to license that and buy it from LSI and to put some drives in, you're talking another thousand, frankly. Okay, that's and, and really part of the core project. Just kind of quickly again, for maybe you said this, and but I wasn't listening. Break down the drive structure on that on that box. What what do you have in there? What's running the OS? What drives do you have in as the VM drives? Sure. Um, let me bring up my storage strategy. Yeah, I'm probably not going to show my desktop. It'll be a little blurry anyway, right, Jim? We'll stick with video. No, it shouldn't be too bad, but it, okay. what, whatever works for you. I'm I'm getting a little weird audio from you. I'm not sure why. It sounds a little a little digitally. If that makes mm. any sense, you know, but just keep going. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if you got anything running in the background there, anything downloading or how you're. No, but after major thunderstorms last night, Cox upstream dropped in, uh, it to one tenth this morning oh. and it dropped to a half later. So, yeah, that could be uh, biting. So, me. maybe yep. it's getting you now. Yeah. Yep. So, after, okay. Yep. Anyhow, uh, yep. okay. So, moving along, let me just go off the top of my head here. So, the parts. 
the Vizilla storage strategy. If you Google for that, we'll find it. Let me just bring it up as a prompt here. Oh, it's right over my own webcam, so I can look at you in the camera as I read my own storage strategy and look through it here. So what I did was I uh, wrote an article at tinkertry.com forward slash. Boy, I didn't get sleep last night. My apologies. Tough day at work. <laughs> Vzilla storage reasoning. So tinkertry.com slash Vzilla storage reasoning. And there it is in the live stream. All right. If you go to that article, you'll see little pictures of how my drives are laid out. Basically, we have an internal RAID controller, an LSI 9265-8i RAID controller that is running five drives. And let me bring that up. Yep, I should share this out. Yeah, five drives. 1.5 terabyte drives, when you do all the math, that comes out to about 5.6 terabytes of RAID 5. That has a solid state drive, the Samsung 830 caching it for fast reads and writes. So I've got a nice performance boost in my RAID 5. So for my day-to-day -day large VMs to take up a lot of space, pictures, videos, that kind of stuff, they're hanging out over there. The lower priority stuff is on an external $200 Mediasonic enclosure. That has four drive bays. Those are two terabyte drives. That also works out to 5.4 terabytes. That's just an eSATA commodity device, RAID 5, affordable, you know, $200 enclosure, four drives I already own stuffed in there, and it gave me a place to do my daily Windows Server 2012 Essentials backups, Jim. So that's the, the basics of my storage strategy. If you're listening and not looking, hopefully that painted a, a decent mental picture. Five drives inside, four drives outside eSATA. Um, that's the gist of it. I also have another enclosure offsite that I'm trying to do site-to-site -site replication. That's the next part of my project. So, okay. So uh, a, a fairly, I mean, you got you've got quite a few drives in there. I mean, it's how many total? Five. And you get SSD caching. Five plus four, so nine total. And the and total the watt burns about 120, 125 watts. Okay. For All right. The system so and the drives. Yep. Fairly consistent, and have you run um, any? This, you know, I assume you've speed checked those drives in some capacity. What kind of throughput are you getting, read and writes, on average? Yeah, I believe drives? I have a. I might have an ATTO benchmark right in this blog post here that I shared with live stream. I'm looking. Okay, yeah, only interested because as I've I've started benchmarking this this new box that I have. Um, it's just brought to light again. You know, I, I'm I am your typical average guy who buys a drive, puts it in, loads the OS. I don't even think twice about it, the speed of it, um, until I you know start having some bottlenecks. And uh, and so I was online last night after the home server show with John uh, John Stutzman and uh, and Chris Kenny. And after the show, Dave dropped off to do Surface Geeks, and we had a chat. And, and I just was reminded of the importance of that ATTO, which is that free, you know, the, the hard drive uh, monitoring or, or, you know, it checks the speed of the drives at various write uh, file sizes. And just how convenient that is to run that against your drives and really get a good indication. Um, you know, I had set up a single laptop drive, a 320 gig, 5400 RPM laptop drive, ran that ATTO and got just miserable results. I mean, it was awful. I could have probably got a floppy to go faster. Um, and then uh, uh, quickly through two, two uh, Western Digital Blue drives, uh, again, laptop drives, I got an abundance of them, so I was just messing around with them. And um, rated those in a RAID 1, uh, no, I'm sorry, in a RAID 0, and doubled the speed uh, of it, actually a little bit more than doubled the speed of it. So. Just a reminder, if you haven't done that before, what Paul is showing uh, is some ATTO little application you can download for free and uh, just install that and run it against your hard drives. And uh, uh, Paul, is there in your experience, is there any problem when you run that against your OS drive on the drive that has it installed on it? Or does that work? You know, I, you wouldn't think you'd have any problems running that against a drive that's not a, you know, that, where the OS is not on it, running against a D drive or E or F or whatever you named it. Have you yeah. seen any difference if you run it against the OS drive that you have that software installed on? No, not at all. Uh, let okay. let's let me explain. Uh, so here I've got in the for those watching video, you see a, a clear picture of an LSI 9265-8i RAID controller. That's around six hundred dollars right there. Um, that has connections to eight SATA drives. So I've got five drives on there, and I get excellent speed whether I boot natively to Windows or to VMware's ESXi 5.1 hypervisor. Doesn't matter. I get a pretty spectacular uh, 
speed here. And if you look in that ATTO benchmark, um, for reads and writes, it's upwards of 400 megabytes per second for larger block size. So that's pretty darn good for a RAID 5. And that's key. It's kind of like I built a SAN for under, well, under three grand if we look at the total price. So I have really fast local storage. No iSCSI, no uh, infant ready NAS from six years ago with a lowly CPU, stuff like that I played with before. Just really slow for VMs. So I wanted to be able to install Windows 8 and have extremely good performance, whether I put on my RAID 5 or if I wanted top tier performance like my Windows Server 2012 Essentials, I just vMotion it, storage vMotion and move it right over to a solid state drive. Then the provision, the thing only takes up 12 gig of physical space of a 120 gig solid state drive. So being able to move things at will between my lower tier storage, the RAID 5, or the high tier storage, the SSD, that's some of the joys of using Hyper-V or VMware. That stuff's just really cool. When, and you realize you've now gone way beyond what your laptop could do with VMware. <laughs> yeah. Paul, tell yeah. me a little bit more about that SSD caching. I mean, how, how do you have that set up? If I were wanting to set that up in my infrastructure, how, how is that controlled? How does that work? Just give me a little summary on that. Okay, so here you're looking for LSI. You have to install some software. For other adapters, high point, you uh, point to a web IP address and use a web you know, browser. This one, though, it's a little more painful, admittedly. And I wrote an article about that's had, um, wow, I, th I think 30,000 hits for people that buy RAID controls and try to get them working in VMware. So it was a struggle. It wasn't well documented. Uh, so that was one of my early, most popular articles that really got going. How do you get this particular RAID adapter to do this magic, you know, read and write caching under VMware or Windows 8 or whatever operating system you install on this machine you build yourself, this seamlessly does RAID caching without any drivers or anything. So the RAID controller is where all the magic is. It's got five drives hanging off of it, a solid state drive hanging off of there as well, and then use this GUI to set up this SSD caching feature, and then it magically just works, speeding up your reads and your writes to your RAID 5, no matter what OS you slap on there and boot from the system. That's the cool part. So that was part of why I was getting this project off the ground as well. I couldn't find anyone blogging about this, you know, period. No one was talking about which motherboard to buy for VMware that cost under 300. And really few people were talking about a decent performing disk array that you could kind of afford on VMware. So now, that's what really got me started. Yep. What would be the difference between having the controller actually accessible at the hardware layer to the virtual machine versus having just the the VDI or your virtual disk files saved on the on a RAID platform? <laughs> yeah, let me, Jim, let me try. This is tricky. Um, great question, Christian. So you've got this choice in VMware, right? You, you, you attached this $200 enclosure I said, I, I mentioned earlier, and it's eSATA, and it's a RAID 5. So let, let's say it's, um, there it is, hanging off your uh, machine. If it's on USB 3, for instance, if it's 5 terabytes, how are you going to let VMware ESXi 5.1, how are you going to let a virtual machine see that USB 3.0? And that's that VM direct path I mentioned earlier. And you pass it through. So during my performance tests, whether I ran it natively or passed through to a VM, or I just formatted it and did things locally uh, with VM, VMFS file system, it's called, where your NTFS, Microsoft format lives on this underlying VMware format, it didn't matter. I was getting like within 7%, no matter what benchmark I ran. So I just gave up and said, heck with it. I'm just going to leave it booted to ESXi full time, and I'll run Windows NTFS, and I'll just stick it on a solid state if I want spectacular performance, and then v storage vMotion it over to this lower tier cheap external enclosure if it's just something like daily backups, where you get decent perf uh, lower performance. The middle tier would be that caching RAID controller that has lots of elbow room. That's where I have five terabytes of RAID 5, you know, data protected uh, against a single drive failure. That would be for the middle tier. So I'm sorry, Jim, I probably lost half the audience there, but basically you have a choice with VMware. How do you want to lay down an operating system on a drive you add to it? And that's what Christian was really driving at. Yeah. Does it matter if you format it with VMware's native one or if you let Windows do its thing and pass through a device and let Windows format it natively as NTFS? And the answer was no. ATTO benchmarks seemed to give me within 7 or 10% uh, the results, so it just wasn't worth me worrying about. And I just moved on. All right. No, no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, Paul, some good stuff. It's a little more detailed. I know you've got this, uh, you know, you've got this all detailed over on your website, and of course you'll put those notes, you know, you put those links in the show notes, and we'll include them as well. So 
that all went pretty fast. And, and actually, chat did a nice job of keeping up with you uh, while you were in there. So, you know, that's it. But if it, if it went a little faster, you want some more information, all that's available. No, I think that's very cool. As, as I, you know, you, you kind of approach this, we're going to talk to Kyle here in a few minutes, um, taking more of an average guy, kind of what I would take approach to it. But, Paul, you, you've really worked through um, some major stuff here. What else did you want to? What else did you want to cover there in your setup? You know, just some closing notes. Because um, once again, I did not read my own show notes. I just answered <laughs> questions. <laughs> no, that's good. That's the way it should be. Yeah. Um, well, we talked about you know self training and certification. I, I can't. I shouldn't really underestimate that. I, a lot of the people I met in my consulting travels uh, from 2006 all the way to 2010, flying all over the country. Uh, a lot of folks really want to train themselves at home. They don't have a lab at work. They they work from home more and more. They need a place to kick the tires. So that's what's kind of cool about playing with Hyper-V or VMware. You're playing with things like uh, network appliances that do iSCSI, maybe teaching yourself that, or SQL Server because you need to learn, you know, MSDN products in a safe way that doesn't affect the rest of the family. So while you're playing with one VM, the rest of your family's laptops are still being backed up, you know, magically by Windows Home Server or Windows Server 2012 Essentials every night. So it's doing practical work right alongside self-training and certification prep kind of work that mm -hmm. IT pros tend to do. So it's that nice balance that uh, I try to emphasize as I talk about these things. And um, the show notes for this are also on my own site and uh, on yours. So I agree. There's a lot of URLs, and I, I just touched upon it, kind of a teaser. And um, Paul, you know, drop, back, drop yep. back to your picture for us real quick so we see you. Yeah, happy to. Let me turn off sharing. There we go. Okay. Uh, real quick, before you wrap it, let me ask you this. So this was a question in chat. You said you have 12 different OSs running on that server, right? Yeah. Is that, was that, what, what do you have? What, what's, what is running there? Yeah, even better. Let me uh, – well, I'll try to show them quickly here. I know sharing takes a second to set up, but it's a tiny little window. Let's see. How does, how does that look? Yeah, there we go. Good. And you're giving me focus? Okay. When yeah, I talk, if it's focused anyway. You'll be focused. There you go. So today, uh, before this podcast, I actually only fired up six. So here's one that does Hamachi tunneling. You can see it's Windows 7, how much memory it's using. Only 0.62 of 2 gig I've given it. So yeah, right now, I'm, I'm not juggling all that much of a workload right now. A handful of uh, old machines. Here's an old XP laptop that died eight years ago. It's living on as kind of a ghost of its former self as a VM version. So I basically uh, took a dead laptop, cloned its hard drive into a VM, and let it, let it rip. And then finally, here's a Windows 7 instance uh, that one of my remote family members uses, kind of a personal cloud. And then finally, here's another VM that's Linux-based, and it takes care of shutting down the whole infrastructure when the power goes out, like last night's thunderstorm at uh, midnight that took everything down. It also beeps my phone as the power goes out. Little, little stuff like that. Those are the kind of articles I like to write, is how do you do that cheaply? Not a $500 battery, but how do you get a $100 battery to tell everything to shut down gracefully when you're not home? Yeah. So... Hopefully that was a good little overview or teaser, Jim. And just a closing comment would be um, Oracle VirtualBox, you know, VMware Player, all those are a whole lot more suited for a lot more people. If you're not running something 24-7, it doesn't make a lot more sense. VMware Player does all you want, or Oracle VirtualBox, for instance. And VMware Player does more than just playback VMs. It, it creates them as well. You don't need the expensive VMware workstation these days much. You can do the free VMware Player. If you're kind of in the virtualization space where you use VMware at work, that might be the way to go. Uh, most other folks just want to tinker with virtualization. You know, Oracle VirtualBox, as others here are going to talk about soon, make well, more yeah. sense. I'm not and trying to sell you on EXXI, right? No, no. And, and let me ask you this. This is That's by four. Do you think, is that the most complicated uh, of the virtualization options available to the average guy? Is that the most complicated one to use, in your opinion? Um, yes, Mike Fouché, he talked about it a little bit. It's a little more complicated than Hyper-V, although I don't need a domain control like Hyper-V. Hyper-V has some... If you set up Hyper-V not as a role on Windows 8, but as a real server, Windows Server 2012, with the added Hyper-V role, you've got some work ahead of, uh, cut out for you, including yeah, you uh, creating a domain controller. Yes, you ESXi, do. ESXi, I can actually install it in a USB key and rekindle my lab after the 60-day trial runs out, for instance, and import all my existing VMs. I can do that in about 90 minutes, rebuilding everything from scratch. So, yeah, there's some practice that went into it, but it's not much harder than Hyper-V. They're pretty close to neck and neck at this point. Now, I had um, Hyper-V running without a domain, so I, I set up Windows Server 2012 Essential. I'm sorry, Windows Server 2012 Standard, and yep. I got the Hyper-V rolling without having to set up a domain, and I got virtualization working. 
Uh, as soon as I tried to use some of the advanced features, it forced me into setting up a domain. But I think you can run the VM, you know, the uh, the Hyper-V role on Windows Server uh, 2012 without necessarily having to set up a domain first. Yeah. Um, some of the features and some of the issues will be some of what you're lacking. If you're trying enterprise stuff, migrating, moving workload, uh, deploying from templates, yeah. then yeah, you, you might run into wishing you had set up a domain. Or remote, you're right. or, or remote desktop connectivity. I should also as, mention, as um, yep, yep. There's Linux and uh, KVM built in to a lot of Linux distros. That's what a, a lot of folks using um, my gear at work also use, a lot of customers. So I'll, I'll close out with that too. There's another virtualization platform out there. If you use, uh, you know, kind of into Linux, it ha tends to have KVM networking uh, built in. So and Zen server also, right? Exactly. Is that one a little bit? Is that one even more trick, more difficult? Would you say? Or I mean, it's enterprise grade like VMware, right? But is that correct? Have not used Zen server uh, anytime recently, so I couldn't speak to it. Um, what, what I will say is all of them have gotten much better, meaning here we are in 2013. You can really run a lot of VMs on 32 gig of RAM on a commodity machine like I, the one I talked about building. You yeah. can easily run 15, 20, 25. What did John, John Stutzman ran how many? Two dozen at the meetup in Indianapolis last year. Oh, if they're not right. doing that much and you're the only system administrator in your house, it's not a big deal. You're de doing one at a time generally. You're not cranking away, you know, rendering video on six of them all at once. So it really, that memory sharing, that transparent memory sharing, like 10 instances of Windows 8 don't use much more memory than one instance because of that transparent memory sharing feature that the enterprise class hypervisors have will blow the doors off of what you find on lowly VMware Play or Oracle VirtualBox where you run out of memory quickly. If you've got four gig of RAM and a laptop, you're not juggling a whole lot of OSs as you know, Jim. So that's where it might be worth the effort to set something up. Yeah, and I know, I know the uh, Zen and the OpenVZ platforms are both super popular for uh, web hosting, uh, especially in budget budget uh, virtual private servers for uh, web and email. Uh, Zen seems to be kind of, uh, I think, takes a bit of an edge because you can, the, the whole debate was which one was faster for the longest time, and I think OpenVZ won the fast, uh, the fast award at one point, but Zen won the reliability and stability, and really with the improvements to the RAID uh, performance on many Zen uh, offerings that you can get on the internet now, really Zen is the way to go. Um, the one OpenVZ uh, instance I ever owned was terrible in comparison to the to the three Zen boxes that I've set up and pay for, and they're they're fantastic. Uh, so those are both common, at least for for Linux hosting. Yep. Um... Also, uh, whatever plat virtualization platform you pick, in my case, you know, a lot of my day job customers are using VMware, a huge majority of them, but Hyper-V is creeping up, so I'm setting up that in a lab for work as well, not just in my home, right? So it's good to get your hands dirty with different platforms and learn them. And I'll close on that note. You can run Hyper-V under ESXi. Why would you want to do that? Well, because one box can be left running 24-7 and have both environments available to an IT pro like me to kick the tires on, not have to power on or reboot or affect my family. I can run ESXi under Hyper-V. And, and you know, again, that sounds cuckoo, but if you're just trying to teach yourself stuff and performance is not your thing, figuring that out was a lot of fun. And that was another popular post that I put in the uh, live stream as well. So who's the host in that situation, ESXi or Hyper-V? ESXi is. It doesn't go the other okay. way around. So you don't actually, okay. if you want to go Hyper-V and try to host ESXi, my understanding is that still doesn't work. Okay. So if you want to run both on one core i7, your only choice right now is uh, running ESXi, hypervisor, left running, and then Hyper-V firing that up when you feel like playing with it. And VMs underneath that Microsoft Hyper-V environment can be V-motioned and you know, moved around. You don't lose the magic. You, you can learn. Yeah, maybe, I'll so, have to go, maybe I'll have to go down a level in my, my virtualization experiment here and try EXSI as the base. Do you think you know the hardware, a little bit about the hardware I'm running it on? Am I going to run into any hardware problems with that? Do I, is there any kind of compatibility check that I need to run before I try to do something like that? There is a Dell, there's a VMware HCL hardware compatibility list. Uh, what's your model? Dell it's a down, six. Right? It's a six ninety Dell Precision Workstation six ninety. So workstations they generally won't have. They do actually have a few Supermicro tie-in and a SUS motherboards listed. So they're showing up more and more commodity stuff in the hardware compatibility list. But for the most part. 
pretty much everything I talked about in this podcast, you're totally unsupported. <laughs> I should say that. If you're not on the hardware list, you're not calling VMware. And on the Hyper-V side, you're not calling Microsoft necessarily unless you're, uh, if you're MSDN, you get some free tickets per year. But I got to be careful with that, right? Jim, this could be tricky. I, I, you know, I'd be happy to help you, help you get going. But if you have a network adapter that's just flat out not seen by VMware, you might not feel like massaging it to make it see it. You might sure. just, you know, sure. throw your hands up and give up, or just it might work just swell and be stable. Uh, purple screens are dead through VMware's potential issue, and for me, I only had two of those in the last two years because I had a SATA uh, cable that was external and too long and had a splice in the middle. That's a hardware problem. That'll blue screen Windows. That'll purple screen VMware. That'll kill Hyper-V. It doesn't matter. That was hardware. So uh, the last thing would just be the practical gym. Family laptops and VM, v, VMware running my Windows Server 2012 Essentials box. That's been key. It saves my skin every two, three months when yet another laptop gives up a hard drive. I've got about 12 laptops I'm backing up daily. Two-thirds of them are not in my house. They're backing up nightly over a VPN. And their hard drives just go. They're three, four, five-year-old laptops. So I'm constantly saving my skin with my own rig, just storing from backup. Something goes wrong, whether it's a virus infection right. or hard drive death. I'm, I'm, right. I'm handling it. Okay. So thank you, Jim. Cool. This is fun. Well, good Sorry. stuff. I, I know a lot of information in a short period of time. Uh, Paul's First got phone. a lot of that information uh, out there on his site and out at tinkertry.com. You can take a peek at those. We'll have a lot of those links in the show notes. So you can head over to theaverageguy.tv slash HT119, and that will get you the show notes for this show. Kyle, I want to switch over to you a little bit and talk about um, kind of what, you know, you, you, I think you approach this more like I do. Paul has a very enterprise-like uh, environment at his place. Uh, you and I, I think, have messed around probably a little bit more on the desktop virtualization, uh, virtualization side. Give me a little, just a, a little rundown on your background, your history with VMs, kind of how you approach it. Yeah, so I, I mean, I've always been interested in technology. I think it was sometime between you know, my senior year of high school or freshman year of college or something. I found I was like, "What? You can run two computers on the same thing? That's crazy!" You know, because I mean, I didn't. You know, hardware is always at a premium. I have, I'm running, always been running on the bare minimum. So I just thought that was awesome, and I and you know. It's you instead of having to try to do a, some sort of dual boot if you wanted to test out Linux or the back in back when I, this was back when you were testing out Windows Vista, you know. So, uh, you know, instead of having to dual boot that kind of stuff or something, you can just fire up a virtual machine, see what it does if you want to test out a software. So, um, I've just always been thought that was so cool you could do that. Um, I mean, back then there was still VMware Player, you couldn't create virtual machines with that yet but now you can um, virtual box and then Microsoft used to have their they pretty much gave up on their desktop side of it now they've replaced it with the Hyper-V and Windows 8 um, but yeah um, right now I have a uh, I, I mean I have VMware player and virtual box installed on my Windows 7 desktop um, I also I I boot I dual I do still do a dual boot it's actually a uh, it's a dual boot to a virtual hard disk, which is different than a virtual machine, if that makes any sense. But it's a uh, so I, I dual boot into Windows Server 2008 R2, and I'm running Hyper V there. Um, and so, um, yeah, and that's on my setup. I have, I mean, I have a bare minimum desktop computer um, with a H67 motherboard, Intel. Um, I have a, a G620 Pentium processor. Um, and a 320 gig hard drive and four gigabytes of RAM, and it still runs Hyper V. You know, so that now it doesn't run. I can run one, two, you know, a couple VMs at a time. It's not super fast, but it's still fun to play around with. Um, yeah, and most of my VMware. Sorry, Kyle. How much RAM did you say? Four gigs. That's it okay. right now. So yeah, I'd love. So... I'd lo obviously I'd love to upgrade that, but it, it, if you need to get done on the cheap. I mean, I built this computer for three hundred dollars. So it yeah. And how many VMs do you run? I mean, certainly with the four gig of RAM, do you find two or three, and three probably being the max you could run at yeah. any given time? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So, but yeah, and then um, for hard drive space, most of my um, most of my virtual hard disks reside on a, a USB three disk there. So, but yeah, I mean. 
Um, it, USB, when you say USB, USB a, fl three. a flash drive or an it's, external drive? Um, this would be, well, actually, um, yeah, you're bringing that up because I, I, I do both. So um, most of them are a USB 3.0, one terabyte disk that's just an external drive. Um, but one of the things that I also got into that I put in our notes here about the is uh, being able to use VMware Player. Uh, all, this, all the computers at the college I was going to had VMware Player installed, and there's tons of things you, if whatever, you know, if you wanted to use their computers, it wouldn't let you install or whatever it would, you wanted. So I, I came up with putting the virtual hard disk on a 32 gigabyte USB flash drive, and I could take that and plug that into any. Um, computer anywhere on campus and fire up and I'd have my own personal desktop right off of a 32 gig USB 3 flash drive. Um, so that's use, that's using VMware player, that's using any computer anywhere that has that, sync your files with any of the cloud storage things. So that's one of my favorite things I did there. That's, um, that's almost like uh, creating a like a Chromebook, right, in a lot yeah. of ways. You're you're piggybacking on somebody else's hardware, so to speak. You don't, have, you know, you're not installing drivers to hardware or whatever. You're just piggybacking, and then you're saving everything to the cloud. Although you could save, would would it allow you to save files to that VM, and they would? They oh would yeah, it's. I mean, it's a full, it's a full VM. I mean, I I would. I, so I'm in. You know, I'm just, I, I'm just. You could just save locally or whatever. But I would have back back then. It was Windows Live Mesh even before SkyDrive. So you know, you you start working on a file there, and then you unplug that VM and go home to your real computer or laptop or whatever, and it syncs. And next time you plug that VM in, it's gonna file boot up and sync again with everything. So, and I don't even remember what whatever. But anything anything you wanted to do on the on the school computers was pretty much locked down if you just wanted to test any kind of software or do anything. So, that was the inspiration for that and if I ever went over to somebody's house, they would just plug it in and away you go, whatever. It's all right there. So, um, that was pretty cool. Um, I like doing that. And then one at one point when I had I uh, threw this in the show notes. I had just this terribly old computer. Um, I think I think it was like a Pentium D processor, and it had 512 mega RAM Windows XP. Um, and I was like, wonder what I can do with this. And so, just power it up, and I put. I don't even remember if I had VirtualBox, probably VirtualBox, and I just got Windows 7 running. Um, so that's 500 megabytes of RAM to run. Windows XP is the host and Windows 7 inside. I mean, it's 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 ridiculous. It what I mean, there was there I don't know if there was even a point to why I was doing that besides to see if I could. Uh, and it was probably slow, but I mean, it's it's possible. So that's uh now that's kind of just some of the different things I've done. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm definitely the complete opposite of just going with the absolute bare minimum as far as processing and all computer power. But yeah. Kyle, on your current on your current box that you're using, what's what's the CPU on that? The it is the one the, that's four gig. It's the Intel Pentium G620. It's a it's the Sandy Bridge um, version, right below the i3 Sandy Bridge. So and I think some of the BYOB guys have messed around with that particular processor. And for for seventy five dollars for that and seventy five dollars for the motherboard, um, it's it's been fantastic. I mean, I. I can't yeah, complain. I, I so. think we just talked about that chip last night on the home server show in reference to, and John Stutzman, if you're out there, I don't think he is, but I think we talked about that. That might be one of the rumored chips that's coming for the new micro servers. I could be wrong there. Oh, that would I, be, yeah. I, I mean, I think it's, a, look. it's, I mean, it's for the price and, and for, and everything I did all during college. And I mean, I, I think video and coding, it slows down, and I notice it's a little bit slowing down when I'm backing up. But I've been super impressed with that processor for the money I spent, and for and because now you know I know if I if I ever want to, I can jump up to an i5 and just the motherboard and everything I've already purchased is good to go, and I can take that processor and throw that into you know uh, any other little you know throw it into a PF Sense or a, a home server or anything you know, and it'll do just fine you know. So I've been super impressed with that. Um, but yeah, you you mentioned VirtualBox. Are are you using that now uh, for for any you know any type of application? Um, I mean, 
predict right recently I haven't I haven't done a ton of different things with either one. I mean, VirtualBox and VMware Player to me, I I, I kind of treat them as the same thing. I just I try them. I do one or the other and go back and forth with no real. I don't me. I haven't researched them enough to see a feature by feature comparison. I just upgraded both of them yesterday to the most recent version and. Um, they're just kind of a different graphical interface to do a lot of the same stuff. I've kind of started leaning, I think, maybe a little bit towards the VMware player, just a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely interesting. Um, yeah, I, I just try them both and see what works for you. I would say, and I threw this in the notes too, and maybe Paul can comment on this. But I was just saying, you know, what if you just had a basic Windows Seven computer, and and you were thinking about running one, two, Windows Eight, Windows Seven, something. You just wanted one, two VMs that were running twenty four seven. Would you use VMware Player or, or um, uh, the uh, the virtual box to just run one or two things just for that, or or would you go to the investment to go to the next level? Well, I used to have something called VMware Server. We could easily make it auto start VMs. So you could just leave a workstation caliber machine and have it auto start, you know, two or three VMs and just leave it running. It's now a little harder with VMware Player. You'd have to kind of write a script to kick off those VMs and make it a, lot, a little more like hypervisor where you can much more easily make things auto start after. Well, and that's the real key, right? So. The real key is the auto start. I mean, these Correct. desktop virtualization um, applications were great for testing, but if you're going to run yeah. it 24 7 and it, they don't gracefully recover, if there's a, you know, uh, the other night when you, <laughs> you were having lightning problems and you lost power. It yep. goes down. It has no way to graceful recover. They don't come back up when when the server comes or what the host comes back up. So, so Kyle, I think you know one of the questions you put: Would you maybe run a VM a, a home server? Right? You could run a home server that way and run that on top of a guest OS. Yeah, I'm not sure you would necessarily. I mean, you'd, you'd have to. You'd have that problem of graceful recovery. Okay. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean. Overall, I, among I other just, things, <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It gets it, it gets a little dicey, but yeah, you know, I've used uh, VirtualBox uh, extensively. I have never used VM Player uh, at all, and I don't know why. I, I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. That that for whatever reason, I lead I lean towards VirtualBox. And and let me just say, if you're listening to the show and you're new to virtualization and you're wanting to try out virtualization without getting crazy about it, I I like uh, VirtualBox as a as an option. First owned by Sun, now uh, Oracle product. They continue to update it. That team has stayed intact uh, even after Oracle has bought Sun, and they continue to push updates. Almost annoyingly, they push yeah. updates yep. uh, very regularly. Yeah, it seems like every time you go to open it up, there's a new update for it. So the product continues to be improved. Um, doesn't have a lot of great hardware support is what I found. It doesn't pass a lot of things through gracefully at all. Um, it does pass some things through, and you can create some. It does have fairly decent USB support, um, but it is my recommendation from I'm, I've me being the average guy trying out VM. If you haven't tried it out before, I think VirtualBox is drop dead simple. Get it installed, fired up, create a VM. There's a wizard that walks you through that asks you for what hard drive size, where do you want it stored, what do you, you know, how much memory do you want to allocate as as virtual RAM those kinds of things and uh, with the exception of one little trick to make sure your network card is turned on properly so that you get access to the internet that's a little tricky on on VirtualBox I think oh, it's Oh come on it's two menu buttons Jim come Yeah on. but you know what it's not intuitive Christian it it's, Well uh, it's because you have your different modes right so your NAT mode is just designed to negotiate through your your actual card it kind of drills a tunnel through your card to get out to specific stuff in particular the internet whereas if you go into bridge mode you're basically giving it uh, physical access to your entire network and everything that's on it so it's not intuitive I, I would say it is intuitive really because yeah, sure. you, you have a network panel you click the network panel you have your four different modes and uh, you pick which card you want to, to use with those um, if it doesn't seem intuitive, I would say you you should go to Google and research to understand the differences between the modes because that's probably what's tripping you up. 
Um, but those are pretty standard terms in terms of how yeah. you want your virtualization to behave with your network card. Well, um, I just know the first time I went to set it up and I didn't get connectivity and I thought, mm, and I wasn't, and I think you're right. I just wasn't sure of the of the different modes that were in there. And I, I chose a couple till I got something that worked and then, and I ran with it. Um, like I said, I think that's the only area where it really, if you're, you're trying it for the first time, you kind of need to be careful. Christian, let me ask you in this. So we, we've been talking about the various things. What, in the stuff that you've worked with, what do you like in the realm of, of virtualization? What do you kind of lean towards? Yeah, I mean, for the average guy, just for running guest VMs on your machine and pre-Windows 8 era, uh, I, I would say VirtualBox is the easiest to do. Um, some of the things I really like about VirtualBox is their uh, driver support for DirectX, Direct3D. Uh, it is beta support, but if you kick your um, guest OS into safe mode uh, for Windows guests, um, it will install a graphics driver that's capable of taking advantage of DirectX, which um, can help you with if you're in the, like gaming or gaming with uh, older software like the old uh, Age Empires 2 engine that everyone still plays but really works best on XPOS because uh, uh, that, that particular engine used, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember the name, I think IGP is the name of the, of the packet that is no longer used after XP and um, and it's a little harder to get, it's been by a little, it's a lot harder to get set up on Windows 7. So uh, for legacy gaming, having DirectX support's awesome, but not just for gaming. For, uh, for me, I like having it because it makes the, um, makes the actual experience with the OS a lot more fluid. So you'll notice if you just install the default uh, guest OS with the default base memory and you don't really do anything with that graphics, your, your graphics and your windows will resize choppy. It won't really look very nice. Um, but if you kick that video memory all the way up to the max, you give it 128 megabytes, you enable uh, 2D and 3D direct draw support, um, you get a really nice picture out of VirtualBox. And I like the flexibility it has for the average consumer to uh, switch between full mode, full screen, and uh, make it look like you're not even in a VM and then coming back out. And I really like the video driver's ability to uh, dynamically change the resolution when you resize the window. I think those are all things that they do really well in this that I like. Um, I never really found VMware Player to be anything special. I felt like VirtualBox had everything VM Player did and did it better. Um, so I really stay away from that for the consumer stuff. Um, but I mean, really, and, and it's nice too, because the, um, the emulation in, uh, VirtualBox is, is pretty nice. It has your basic features. You can set execution caps, so it's not killing your CPU. You can enable certain, uh, chipset features and, uh, APIC features. And, um, you know, there, there's nice, there's nice stuff where it's, it's not overkill, but it still gives you some control over uh, how you want things to run. So I like this for the average consumer. Um, in the server realm and environment, I'm really kind of still using uh, Hyper-V. That's really been the thing for us, um, especially with uh, Server 2012. Um, being able to set up your, your different Hyper-V instances, it's really, really powerful stuff. Um, especially the improvements that Microsoft has put in since 2008 where there were limitations such as you couldn't allocate more than four cores with the Hyper-V. Now that's gone. Uh, you're getting some nice performance for uh, for your buck. And uh, it, it really, Hyper-V is not a terribly hard thing to set up if you're just trying to do it in like a developer sandbox type of deal. Um, if you have the skills to set up VirtualBox, which is not that in-depth, you can set up a relatively basic Hyper-V without killing yourself. And uh, it's, it's flexible, and it's, and it's nice to have it all in that kind of domain environment. And I, someday, one of these shows, I, I really need to find a way to reach out to the average guy and convincing them that joining a domain network is not the end of their, their life. That's that, the next show, Christian, that's the next series you and I are going to do is we're going to talk about domains. That's, yeah, you, you've picked it. Cause you're right in our community is every time we go to a, a domain, it's a watershed moment. It's either yeah. you hate it, you love it, or you hate it. 
And it's like, really, guys? It's like the equivalent of saying that, you know, let's let's stay away from uh, CD-ROMs because we've all had our floppy drives for so many years. It's that same kind of um, jump into the next technology phobia, right? Um, really, really, you can make domain networks as simple or as hard as you want it. And there is so much to configure. You can go as far out into the enterprise corporate space as you want with it. That's the nice part about it, is that you can mold it and build with it and actually kind of learn some of this stuff you wouldn't otherwise by having it. But if you don't want to get into that and you just want the simple, you know, security domain, all my PCs can see each other, yay, file sharing, fine. It still has all of that and you can do that relatively easy and like I tried to allude in the uh, Windows 2012 Essentials video um, you know there's no big mis I mean they've stripped down in 2012 Essentials the the um, the pain of going to a domain I, I think they've taken that away from the user they basically say you know uh, join the domain here's your login account and don't migrate your profile and you're good to go you're on a domain hooray you don't even have to start a DHCP or a DNS server on it. You can leave that all at the router. Uh, really, domains are not as scary as people make it out. And I, I actually wonder what it is that makes people get so about domains. And I wonder if it's because they've never named a work group with a .com or a .local and they just go, oh my gosh, it's a, it's a website, it's a domain, It's i got to hook it up to the internet now, where's my modem? No, 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 no. It's it's much simpler than that, and I really think it could be spun. We got to put some kind of guy together yeah, where we yeah. spin um, setting up domains for the average developer sandbox uh, guy. Because I mean, obviously, it would be a completely different story if I was trying to teach you the enterprise security domain setup for a, a government agency. But that's not what we're doing here. So um, you can get security and performance and happiness all in one package without. Uh, without crying at night and and having restless nights and and, uh, and remember if you disagree with Christian it's Christian at the average guy dot <laughs> <laughs> if you if you no I Christian I totally agree with you the that there is uh, there is a scariness you know, around that and, and I think so so good we'll we'll uh, put that on the back burner as a future discussion for domains we will we'll bypass it for now at this point. Um, and, and we'll come back around to that here in the next three, four, five weeks and, and maybe do a series or two on domains. Paul, you want to kick that off for us when we do the domain series? You want to talk about your domain? Or, or lack thereof. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot. You yeah. know, okay, you have to no, no, I, I've, I've used them at the work world, but, yeah, yeah I just don't need them, and the, I don't intend to train, you know, dad or, or wife or anyone yeah. else on yeah. being anything other than work group. That's, that's all it boils down to. All I care about is backup for them. I don't maintain or, or administer them. Yeah. So they just have local logins. They're not even in my home, those machines. So right. no big deal. I, I could yeah. go either way, and I've used them at work. It just doesn't suit me. So so I just do a domain-free install of Windows Server. Essentially. Sure, sure. And we'll have to come back around to that. Kyle, yeah. I kind of went over to Christian, but but anything else that you wanted to, you wanted to say on your virtualization section? Uh, you're muted, yep. Kyle. Yep, there, there we go. go. Um, just, well, just I just had one other thing, or maybe a couple other things was the... Uh, the VMware player and comes with the VMware converter tool, which and I think um, Paul had this too. But it's just it's just perfect for having an old computer and that old XP computer that I had when I got the upgrade. I just took that and virtualized it and pointed the thing at. Uh, I don't even. You just point the software <laughs> at it. Thing that's fine. It's a just, technical term. Yeah, it okay. just it just does it. It really just does it all on its own. There's nothing really to it. So. It just copy. It just takes literally an entire picture of that computer, and then you can anytime if you ever think, "Oh man, I think I missed something in my data transfer," you can just go back and fire it up. Now, I think um, I think I just realized that that was one of the things I lost when my hard drive died, so I can't fire up that old XP anymore myself. But I, I did fire it up several times um, before I lost it. Um, and it, it was perfect. You just fire it up and say, what did I have installed or what was that program or whatever? And it, so that is just great to be able to make a backup like that um, and have that. Now, obviously, that was a smaller computer. It was only like a 30-gig hard drive. So, um, And there's there's tons of other things you can do with virtualization. Um, 
there's a more of an enterprise type thing with the Zen client um, has started coming out thing that's more designed for having a laptop so you can run like a work and personal and I I tried to install that once and uh, that's interesting and um, VMware workstation is really powerful too um, and if you just if you don't want to build a whole server and you just want to do the some of that like what uh, Paul was talking about the nested type stuff um, you can do that in VMware workstation with just right from the desktop um, and there's a guy at virtualized geek um, on Twitter at virtualizedgeek.com and he's done a ton of stuff and just kind of always talks about that so I don't I haven't actually VMware workstation is what a hundred two hundred three hundred dollars something so I haven't spent the money for sure but if you know if you ever do want to do where you could have a virtualization lab essentially without building everything that Paul did you can do a lot of that kind of stuff right there if you just want to pay for the software so yeah Kyle good points like you know snapshotting and rolling back a VM when you want to play with software if it goes horribly wrong you can roll back 10 minutes that's the kind of cool stuff VMware Workstation can do you certainly don't need a Hyper-V or, or ESXi server set up for that kind of fun stuff. It's amazing what you can do for developing yeah. or testing software. Yeah, and he uh, yeah. he puts, I mean, he he runs ESXi in VMware Workstation, which is just crazy that we've gotten to that level of support for um, yeah. So for doing that. So. And laptops can start to handle 8 or even yeah, 16 gig he, of RAM. That makes all the difference. Yep, and he yeah. that's what some of the things he, he talked, this other guy talks about, not to, you know, go off on a tangent with him but just I don't even know I just found him on Twitter one time and he has a laptop that he has a virtualization lab and he does a lot of the training stuff that you're talking about that's one of the main reason he uses it so um, yep. it's just amazing what you can do with with the software now that you can actually virtualize virtualization <laughs> and, and yeah. he's at virtualizedgeek.com right yeah and uh, follow him Twitter virtualized geek just on Twitter in Jim, late 2008, 2009, Vista days, beta, 64-bit, the first client operating system you could do 64-bit reasonably. That ran VMware Workstation quite well, and you could finally get to 8 or 16 gig of RAM that I flew around and, and did customer trainings on with multiple copies of Linux running along Windows. It was the only way to do it. A laptop with lots of RAM and a 64-bit OS that went beyond that 3 gig memory boundary. So, yeah, things have gotten much better in the last five years. Cool. Yeah, I well, it's I think with uh, with the hardware we've gotten to the point now where it's fairly affordable. I mean, you're, that's what you're saying, Paul, is yeah. that you can build this monster rig under three thousand bucks, and uh, you know there were days when you couldn't get a PC for three thousand bucks. So it's it's the price points have just dropped to where the average guy. You know, when we kicked the show off, Paul, as you were going through your segment, Rich O'Neill ping me on Skype and he goes and this is the average guy podcast <laughs> and uh, and you know the, the point is that I think we are getting to the point where the average guy and let's just say the average tech guy I say that in the opening of the show you know that we're really a show here at home tech for the average tech guy and uh, and I, I consider myself to be the average tech guy I mean you guys are definitely above average from from that standpoint but I, the point is is that if I can do it and I'm doing that right now I've got this this workstation that I'm working on and I'm I've been messing around in fact I actually just burned a, a copy of uh, Windows Server 2012 trial version because I didn't want to burn up my activations uh, my MSDN and our TechNet activations for server because I wanted to install this thing over and over and over again to try different scenarios with they it. Don't and now, the activations. now well okay Christian and then uh, <laughs> the, uh, the on server side they don't No. Oh. They're they're generic uh, activations. As long as you don't go activating them in Russia, you're fine. Oh, oh well, there you go. So, but that's how I was going to get around it, and I thought that was a creative solution. <laughs> Maybe not. Good work, but, Good work. Yeah, thank you. Well, yeah, you know. Well, so. I mean, you could always. I mean, I guess it's not it's not a terrible thing to just keep using trial versions because you can still pop your Technic key in when you're deciding to go off a trial. So Yeah, well, and trial doesn't require the, 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 the activation key at all. So you don't even have to spend that, you know, that step of putting the activation key in. It just yeah. rolls through. And I, in a test environment, I plan to blow that away every, you know, couple, three weeks anyway, uh, just as I learn about it. So I think if I can do it, you can do it too. If you haven't, if, if you haven't tried that, you might want to follow along on the podcast with us, and and uh, maybe if you can get a piece of hardware that you can get some of this stuff on. Anything from what Paul's doing with some heavy virtualization, you know, running some RAID and getting a, getting your storage right, and maybe some SSD caching, or just even using an SSD as the OS drive to speed it up too. 
uh, it is Kyle saying here. Kyle's got some older or some slower uh, hardware uh, that uh, he's running VM stuff on as well, and it works in that environment as well. You don't have to have super, you know, a lot of equipment or a lot of hard drives or even a lot of storage space to get VM working for you. You can give that a shot as well. Christian, you want to add anything else to that conversation? Um, no. Not in particular. I think that's a pretty good You're rep. done. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, I want to I want to move on to a new segment we're adding in. And, guys, I want you to chime in on this. Uh, the new segment is uh, from the Facebook group. I guess we'll just call it from the Facebook group. So a bunch of you guys have jumped in over the last couple of weeks. Of course, you know, we've been offering. we got a contest going. If you join the Facebook group and we grow that thing to 250 members, it is a closed group. You have to ask for permission to get in. But if you go to Facebook.com slash groups, slash uh, the average guy and it's actually been blowing up during the show here live you guys have been don't don't tweet or don't go out on Facebook listen to the show but anyways um, uh, guys have been posting out there if you want to post a question to get it into the podcast we'll read it right from Facebook and get it in and actually there's a long thread behind this but John Greenaway uh, who's been out on the group for a while now asked uh, this question for the podcast tonight he said um, just started my move from version one, that's Windows Home Server version one, EX, uh, it's an EX495, to he's running a Windows Server 2012 Essentials. He's using the 180-day demo license to get it started. Running on an N54L, we've talked a lot about those over at the homeservershow.com. In fact, all of last night's episode was talking about the performance difference between the N36, N50, or N40, and N54L, homeservershow.com. If you want to check that out from last night, he has a crucial SSD OS drive and eight gig of RAM on it. Via the version one is still in production, and he's been taking the migration slowly. However, I think I'd like to run some of my apps like iFi, Media Streamer, and Media Management Software in a Windows 7 VM on 2012 Essentials. It seems that the Hyper V is not an option for me since the role isn't supported in Essentials. What's my next best alternative, and is it VirtualBox? So, Paul, let me throw that over to you. I'll just kind of go around the horn here. If he's the Hyper V role is not available in 2012 Essentials, Paul, what are your suggestions? Well, in my case, I, I flipped it around so uh, I can run. Well, I happen to have VMware running, which allows me to run Windows Server 2012 Essentials just fine as a backup server. And then I have Hyper V running alongside it as a, a virtual machine, you know, next to Windows Server 2012 Essentials. Not an ideal solution for everyone because, again, licensing and setup and configuration concerns. Right, so right. I suspect uh, most people would just want to use maybe MSDN or TechNet and just go with Windows Server 2012 with the Hyper-V role, the, the real thing. And yeah, then standard just, would work for you just fine. Correct. Want, and, then, that route. and then run Windows Server 2012 Essentials as a VM under that Hyper-V. Okay. So that's probably a more typical rig than the goofiness I'm doing. Okay, so may, that's maybe more an advanced uh, option with, with um, it, assuming you have a tech net or you're going to go buy the licensing, which could get a little expensive for somebody oh, if they yeah. wanted to buy all those those pieces. Um, so, Kyle, uh, from you, you I, we're going to throw this situation at you. you. You you might be in that right now. You you don't have access to those things. What's your what's your best option for a Windows 7 VM running on something that does not support Hyper-V, in your opinion? So, so – to run a Windows 7 VM or to run yep. Server 2012 Essentials? No, to run a Windows 7 VM in an environment that does not support a Hyper-V role. Yeah, I mean, VirtualBox or VMware Player, right? I mean, um, I, like I said, I think I've recently been using VMware Player more. Um, I don't know if there's any particular reason for that, but... Am I understanding the question right? I was kind of reading chat yeah. earlier. No, so. no, yeah, it's all right. Yeah. It's a, it can be a little distracting. No, I think, in, in other words, if I can't use Hyper-V, right, if I can't create a Hyper-V environment, which they can't with Windows uh, twenty Windows Server 2012 Essentials, the Hyper-V role is not available to them. So I, I'm not going to – and that's going to be my base OS. What's my next best virtualization oh, right. option? Yeah, yeah. And I was thinking about that. That is one of the I, – I like the idea of 2012 Essentials and – but you you do lose your virtualization, so that's kind of almost your that's doing the actual server tasks, but you still want to figure out a virtualization strategy around that. So, I mean, uh, if I was using 2012 Essentials, I think I would almost always want to virtualize that. Um, whether that's using the free free Microsoft hypervisor, you can get that free. You can get ESXi free. You can get Zen free. You can get you know any whatever you want to do. But since that doesn't support Hyper-V, 
you know, you could still throw you could still throw a VMware player or, or VirtualBox on it and do it that way. But I don't know. For me, if I have, when I get around at some point, hopefully, to building 2012 Essentials, I feel like I would want that to be virtualized in whatever situation because um, I feel like it. It doesn't. I mean, it doesn't wait. If you have the hardware, it doesn't waste a box to use it on. But I feel like I could have some more potential if I go the route of virtualizing 2012e that way. So, okay. but if you need, but if you want to just have, you know, a, a Win Seven desktop sitting there and just log in it remotely or whatever, yeah. I mean, VMware Player VirtualBox will let you do that. So, all right, perfect, uh, Christian. Um. If you want Hyper-V and you don't really want to spend the money on licenses if you don't have TechNet, upgrade to Windows 8 and use the Hyper-V client that's built into Windows 8. It's probably your best way to use and be exposed to the Microsoft technology without paying an expensive license, if Hyper-V is your thing. Like I said, apparently I haven't used it yet, but the Hyper-V client for Windows 8 is pretty easy to snap in, download, and set up. So Yeah, it sounds like, you know, in this in this case, he's got a uh, an N54L, so not the fastest processor in the world, but it does have 8 gig of RAM, so it support two, maybe one or two VMs on that. On that box, um, and so, and if if he's got 2012e right now, so John, if you got 2012e, if you're getting through that through TechNet, you've got other options as well. And I think you know, put standard on there uh, as the base. Is that yeah. Kyle? Go ahead and mute for me if you can. Um, you got 2012 as the base, and um, you can always run uh, 2012e. Uh, as in a VM with that, you could run those two together in eight gig of RAM, and then virtualize your Windows. Um, virtualize your Windows 7, put your VM on, on top of that as well. So that's another way to do it. I think you got some options. Just depends on licensing and what you want to pay for and and uh, some of those things. So that's, again, that's a question out on the Facebook page, facebook.com slash group slash the average guy. That discussion's not over. Actually, it's got quite a long thread, and some of the guys kicked in here just a few minutes ago and put some answers to it. So, John, thanks for uh, jumping out there and asking a question for the show. One more before we kind of go into rap mode. Gordon Schmidt, who's a good friend and been on the podcast a bunch over the last couple of years, asked this for it. He says, so um, thoughts on Hyper-V CPU power management issue. Anyone having issues with USB 3 uh, drivers and Hyper-V? So, Paul, let me throw this over to you. You've probably got, when we talk about a troubleshooting standpoint, any issues, uh, anyone having issues with USB 3.0 drivers and Hyper-V? Uh, well, last time I was working with Hyper-V before the 3.0 recent release, it's still just not there for um, any kind of USB 3.0 support, whereas VMware, that was one of my shopping concerns, where you at least can pass through uh, USB 3.0 support to VMs. So back when I was doing all the shopping two and a half years ago, that was my option. I believe that's still kind of true today. You don't really get uh, native support on Hyper-V to just have a you know, USB 3.0 key attached to a VM and have it work fast. Okay. Uh, in, in VMware, you, you kind of do, and I have an article about that. There's some limitations. It's kind of a kind of like a remote USB over IP where your client workstation uh, has USB 3, and that's passed through to a remote virtual machine. Kind of not what you really expect, but I guess that way you don't have to walk over to the server and plug in your USB 3.0 device. So it's getting there. Uh, maybe in a year or two, that'll totally change, and a full whole hog USB 3.0 support natively on both hypervisors. Okay, Christian or, or Kyle, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, because I have, like I said, I dual boot into Server 2008R2, so that's the full and that's the full Windows operating system, and then Hyper V is running on top of that. So, in Server 2008R2 itself, I just install the USB drivers. Now that, so if I have a, a virtual hard disk sitting on a USB 3 device, it'll the, the host will see that as USB 3. It can do that, but it's not going to, if I want to plug a USB 3 into the virtual machine, that's not going to, where it's not going to be seen for me. So I got the drivers installed so the host can take advantage of it, but it's not going to go up to the virtual level, which for me is, is fine. I just need, I just need to, the host to read those files on a, either a USB key or an external USB 3 drive at USB 3s and that's it that's all I need so okay okay Christian any thoughts uh yeah I mean I haven't really needed to have USB USB 3 or any of that kind of stuff running in my Hyper-Vs cuz I'm mostly just transferring files directly between networks I can't really imagine 
any other reason you would want USB 3 capability unless you were doing your eSATA hard drives and whatnot. So, uh, with your docs and all. But I, one of the things I like to do is um, set up shares on, like, if I'm using VirtualBox, where you set up network shares that the guest sees as network shares, but they re in reality go to physical locations on your own hard disk, and that makes file transfers easy between the host and the guest. But I, I don't really use USB 3.0 docking on my setup because I'm a pretty um, headless guy with uh, my desktop configuration. So, Okay. Good stuff. Again, uh, you can catch Gordon. He's over at myneejerkreaction.com. He actually posted that out to his blog and has got some info around that as well. And that question's posted out at the Average Guy or at the uh, the Average Guy Facebook group. So I dropped that in chat as well. If you want to take a peek and uh, see what we're talking about over there, again, we're doing this contest. So when we get to 250, we're giving away 100 Amazon bucks to to uh, one lucky winner that's in there. So head over there uh, maybe this weekend when you're listening to the podcast and, uh, and get signed up. Enjoy the conversation. Really good conversation. I'm really enjoying, you know, I do, there's not a lot I enjoy about Facebook anymore. Uh, I really enjoy the, the average guy group that we got going on out there. And uh, you guys got some really good stuff happening. And so I appreciate you coming in and joining. All right, let me do and say hi to Gary there. Uh, Christian, he seems to be making his updates now via the <laughs> coming in the back door. Hey, Gary, how you doing? <laughs> uh, a couple things I wanted to chat about real quick, uh, just some updates uh, for you guys out there who listen and who follow me and what I do. Um, if you listen to Home Server Show, you know on my birthday this last weekend, my geeky family bought me a Drobo 5N. And if you don't know what that is, just head out to drobo.com. And you got to know, if you know me, you got to know what a Drobo is. I just talk about them all the time. In fact, so much so that Christian pinged me yesterday and said, what is it with you and Drobo? What do you like about them so much? And uh, I, I do like what they do in their boxes. But um, the 5N, I've been working on that. It, uh, the 5N comes with some Plex support as well as some an app for copy.com. And uh, we actually, uh, uh, both John Stutzman and Chris uh, Kenny last night talked me into running some ATTO tests against the Drobo, both the FS, the new 5N, and then the 5N also has a support for an M SATA card, and uh, this just came in the mail today. This is a 64 gig crucial uh, M SATA card. It was uh, $82 on Amazon, and not terribly expensive for that. 64 gig, basically SSD caching for the for the Drobo device, so the file goes onto the SSD first off the network, and then it's uh, smart enough to be able to move that file onto the spinning drives into the Beyond RAID uh, portion of the drives for storage, and so you get uh, you get really, you get a much faster file transfers than the old uh, Google FSs, and uh, and get a little better speed off the new 5N. So I'm kind of excited about them. I got them both set up side by side here, just on the other side of the monitors, and uh, appreciate my family chipping in some dollars. And, uh, and Tim, I'm surprised we haven't seen the dollar signs yet in chat, but uh, the family chipping in some dollars to get me a 5N, and of course, John, my son works there, and so a very cool purchase and a very nerdy uh, gift for their dad on uh, on his birthday. So it's it'll be fun. You can listen for me to talk about that coming up. If you've uh, if you haven't been out to the Average Guy TV in a while, head over there real quick. And uh, I just bought a new WordPress plugin from Daniel J. Lewis. We interviewed Daniel. I don't know, 10, 15 shows back. Uh, he has a podcast. He's a guy who podcasts about podcasting among other things. And Daniel got tired of trying to write uh, or trying to create his own uh, or having to create graphics all the time for his customers that were links to like iTunes and Stitcher and, and those, you know, RSS feeds. And so he created his own WordPress plugin, which is really cool. If you're a WordPress user, if you go to theaverageguy.tv and look on the right-hand column, we have some new, we got some new ways for you to subscribe, to subscribe to the podcast. By the way, if you're not subscribing, you're not getting it regularly. And of course, subscribing is always best, but Click on any of those links. It'll take you to the various ways that you listen to the podcast, either via iTunes or Stitcher or RSS if you're if you're still using a Zoom player or any kind of other device, even like Beyond Pod on Android uses RSS to, to make that work. You can go out there and get the podcast subscribed in just about any way that you listen to it. If you are, say you have a player and you, you can't find me in it, let me know so I know to subscribe over there. Um, we're just about everywhere now. So... Um, go out and take a peek at those. Give me your feedback. Daniel did a nice job. That is a that that plugin is in 106 version 1.0.6. I think maybe seven now. And uh, just like your feedback, 
there's also some other things, some improvements coming that I can change. If you have your own WordPress site and you're interested in doing that, the plugin actually today and tomorrow is just 27 bucks, and it'll go up to 37 in uh, in June. I love it because it saved me a ton of time and it gives me some great icons. So check that out, Daniel J. Lewis is. It's called, um, and I should have wrote, written this down. It's called Follow and Subscribe, and you can find it on WordPress if you're a WordPress user at all. Very cool plugin going forward. I was I already mentioned earlier that uh, the Facebook group's giving away 100 bucks. So get out there and join the group today. Get that done over the weekend. And I'm hoping to actually have this podcast out very early. I've got to go to Oklahoma this weekend, and I won't get much chance to mix a podcast. So it will uh, hopefully it'll be in the stream here real quick, and you guys will have an opportunity to listen to it soon. Okay, let's see. Let me make sure I covered everything in the show. Any last uh, any last words, guys, before we kind of wrap this thing up? Meet up. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Kyle, thanks. Thanks for for bringing that in. There is a meetup coming up September 21st. In Indianapolis, Indiana, if you're anywhere between Omaha and Indy, let me know. I might even pick you up and take you in. Uh, we'll be making the uh, 10-hour trek across the country to get to Indy. September 21st, it's actually a home server show, surfacegeeks.net, averageguy.tv kind of combo meetup. Um, Kyle, you were there last year. We had 30-some guys there. We already have about 30 registered for this meetup, and so we're a third of the way to our 90-person cap. And uh, if you want to be there, get, get over to the homeservershow.com and there is a link across the top of that site that you can get signed up for the meetup. Love to have you there. If you're anywhere within, we say, 10 hours of driving, it's pretty much mandatory that you're there. Uh, no excuse because I'm coming. You should be going too. And uh, and even Mike Howard has said, let's put the pressure on Mike Howard here. Even Mike Howard, JPEG to Raw, Mike Howard, host, regular host here and host of JPEG to Raw. Um, he said he may drive up from Atlanta. It's an eight-hour drive for him. So I think it's going to be, uh, to use an 80s word, I think it's going to be epic. So you're going to want to be there, and uh, it's going to be a good time had by all. And uh, just the 21st, we'll have a good time. We'll come together on Friday night and then geek out all day Saturday, and um, it will be, it'll be a good time. So if you want to do that again, homeservershow.com. Look for the link up there. Kyle, thanks for bringing that in. All right, well, with the silence there a second ago, we will call it a night. And uh, Christian, thanks again for coming out. A good, uh, safe travels for you as you make your way down. It's down, right? I make your way down, down. to Langley for, uh, and that's right, right? Langley for, uh, for your summer job at a small company called NASA. And uh, we're looking forward to following you as you do that. So the next podcast we have for you, you'll be, uh, you'll be down there, right? Indeed. Yeah, very, very cool. So thanks for coming on. Kyle, nice job on your first podcast here on Home Tech. Good work. I appreciate you coming out tonight. Thank you. Yeah, you it was back. fun. It was a blast. Good, good. Well, we'll have you back again. So I appreciate you coming out tonight. And then, uh, Paul, great to have you as well. Always good to have you on. We'll have tons of links uh, in the show notes. And actually, it's just easier uh, rather than, I mean, we will put them in our show notes. So averageguy.tv slash HT119. But Paul has got a great site. If you just go to tinkertry.com. There's tons of stuff out there, and uh, there's stuff that Paul is the only one talking about, uh, and he's getting tons of hits because he's the kind of the definitive answer on it out there. And so you definitely want to check out his site because um, there's just some really good stuff. out. Paul, I didn't realize how much you wrote. I mean, you just write a ton. How do you find the time to do that? <laughs> Evenings, weekends. Yeah. I guess I didn't know I had it in me either. Uh, it's only one or two articles a week, but after two years of doing it, it adds up. Yeah, and I, we're not talking like we're not talking like icon articles, uh, you know, one-liners in a forum. I mean, we're talking about full-on, you know, charts and graphs and pictures and a lot of text. So that's that's a lot of work. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, your comment saying stop writing stuff that no one else is talking about. I, I think that's a compliment. It, that's how I feel. It's like crickets <laughs> on Google sometimes when I look for something, and then I'm like, okay, maybe I should just. Right, yeah. what little I know about it. And yeah, it's well, fun. but it's that's good. Hard. I mean, if you're if you're the only one talking about it, there's other people who are probably having that problem that uh, that need help. And you know, you kind of mentioned earlier, you got a lot of hits off one article that probably indicates that uh, you're the only one who took the time to write it up. So good work. Thank you. And uh, for folks, you know, listening, visiting, or following on Twitter, Tinker Guy is the name there. It's all on the upper right corner of tinkertry.com. How to follow me on Google Plus or or subscribe to the channel on YouTube. It all helps enormously, Jim. As you know, it's all just 
voluntary spare time stuff. Yeah, no, and anything right to help pay the way posting bills really helps. So. Right on, right on. Kyle, if we want to find you on on um, Twitter, how do we find you? I am at Kyle J W X, and I'm I'm trying like the bear the baby starting website like what Paul has. So maybe hopefully I'll get some exclusive content like what he has. But I have oh, nice. Kyle Kyle J W X So okay. Well, cool. if you want to practice and you want to get some eyeballs, you can always post that out at theaverageguy.tv, and uh, we, we can get you a little exposure out there. We get a few a few eyeballs on that site, so you can uh, you can always post out there if you want to do that. And then, Christian, we're really trying to get you some followers. So, uh, what's your Twitter again? At the Wiz B M, all one thing, T H E W Z B M. Yeah, follow Christian. Uh, especially, he'll be tweeting some cool stuff this summer as he uh, as he does his internship uh, again for the second year at NASA, so very cool. Well, we'll remind folks, we do the show each week, Thursday night, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, out here at TheAverageGuy.tv Live. We'd love to have you out there. I want to thank the, man, we had a bunch of viewers on YouTube tonight, and if you're watching on YouTube, you're always welcome to come over to TheAverageGuy.tv slash live and join us. You can track me down. I'm actually super active on Google Plus right now, so you can track me down on Google Plus. Just find me, either Jim Collison or the Average Guy TV. Of course, you can find me on Twitter at Jay Collison. I don't use that as much. Uh, I, I kind of tweet when the show is coming out, and you can always send me a message over there as well. And, of course, you know, you've heard me say the Facebook link a million times. And I won't say it again. But i uh, love to chat with you if you have something to say. And, of course, uh, we if you send me a voicemail, if you send me an email, if you send me anything and you want to get that on the show, just note that, and we'll talk about it going forward. So stay around for the post show if you can. We, stay, we usually stay around for a little bit, and some of the, actually some of the best conversation is in the post show, and you'll never hear it. If you don't come out live, because I don't usually I don't put the post show comment content inside the feed that goes out. No YouTube, no MP3. You're missing out on a good time. So come out and join us live Thursday nights, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, out here at the Average Guy TV Live. That'll do it for tonight. I still got half a glass of wine, so we're gonna finish that up as we go on the post show. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Good night. <laughs>